So we got about double it, don't we? So we're talking about $2,400 per year from every one of you taxpayers just for interest on the national debt. And it's going this way. Well, I had an old friend up in northern New Hampshire. I used to go visit every once in a while, a wonderful man. And I think it must be as much as 20 years ago, he said to me, Jack, he says, you know what they're going to do? They're going to run up the debt. He said, debt leads to borrowing. Borrowing leads to interest. Interest leads to taxation, and taxation leads to control over you and me by government. He was absolutely right, wasn't he? Just think about that again. Debt leads to borrowing. Borrowing leads to interest. Interest leads to taxation to pay the interest. And taxation is control over you and me by government. And there are some people who are saying, there's nothing we can do about it. We just have to keep going further in debt. Why? Why? If any one of you ran your household that way, you'd soon be in jail. That might be a good solution to our government's problem. We right now have two to three hundred billion dollar deficit. Two to three hundred billion dollar deficit. And we give away foreign aid. I got a major section in my book about foreign aid. It's an incredible story. I saw an article in a newspaper recently where Nikita Khrushchev's son, who is now teaching at Brown University, begged the United States not to give foreign aid to Boris Yeltsin. He said, as things stand now, most would likely disappear without a trace into the secret accounts that Russian bureaucrats and industrial managers hold in Western banks. I think that's totally believable. I have evidence to back that up from other places. But you know, there's another kind of foreign aid that we give, and that's the defense budget that we take on for other nations. We station American troops all around the globe. You know right now we have troops guarding Japan. We have troops guarding South Korea. They're industrial giants. We pay their defense bills. We have troops in Europe guarding West Germany from East Germany, but they're reunited. We have troops in the Middle East. We have troops in Somalia. We have troops here. We have troops there. We have them all over the place. Was it only a few months back there were people saying, we've got to cut down some of the bases. We've got to... Uh, we got to close some, some military bases. So I was on a radio show, and they asked me, well, what do you think about that, Mr. McManus, Mr. John Birch Society? I said, I agree. I think we ought to close down a lot of bases. <coughs> South Korea, Japan, Okinawa, Middle East, Somalia, you name it. <laughs> and we ought to bring the troops home. Bring the troops home. Um, <clears throat> we now have the president over in Europe talking about expanding NATO. He's not going to do it in one step. It's going to be a step and a step and a step and fine. They asked me on Pat Buchanan's show today, what did I think about NATO? I said, I think it's a good idea. We ought to let Poland in. We ought to give them our seat. <laughs> in 1949, when... When NATO was being discussed by the United States Senate, Senator Robert Taft of Ohio gave a major speech called The Future of the Republican Party, and he pointed out to the horror of military combat and stated that America should enter into a war only, quote, to protect the liberty of our people, close quote. This is what our founders intended, and he's right. Taft's speech strongly criticized the Truman administration because it had, quote, adopted a tendency to interfere in the affairs of other nations, to assume that we are a kind of a demigod and Santa Claus to solve the problems of the world, and that attitude is more and more likely to involve us in disputes where our liberty is not, in fact, concerned." Close quote. Senator Taft was the acknowledged leader of the Republican Party at the time. He was concerned about NATO's capability to become a drain on the U.S. economy in 1949. Before another year had elapsed, American forces were dying in an undeclared war in Korea under UN auspices. 
Asked under what authority he had sent troops to Korea, President Truman replied that if he could send troops to NATO, which he had done, he could send them to Korea. End of argument. Truman's attitude certainly proved Taft correct. Taft responded to the president and said, if the president can intervene in Korea without congressional approval, he can go to war in Malaya or Indonesia or Iran or South America. And he could have added, or Panama, or Iraq, or Somalia, or Bosnia, or Haiti, or who knows where else. As Taft said at the time, by acquiescing in the president's assumption of power regarding troop commitments to Korea, the Senate was cooperating in, quote, terminating for all time the right of Congress and Congress alone to declare war. He said that 40 years ago, folks. 40 years ago. What about NATO? Give Poland our seat. We have a lot of headlines here about Mr. Clinton's deficit cutting. I have them some, some, some newspapers here. What do I, I have Clinton vows more trims in spending. Yes. Yes, indeed, he vowed. <laughs> Senate gives final approval to the Clinton deficit plan. Yes, which was far more taxation than spending cuts and and I could have brought a lot more of these but but what's the point we can see what they're doing they had a chance recently to actually cut the deficit a congressman named Penny from Minnesota had already announced that he's not going to run for re-election he can't stand it anymore he's a Democrat as a parting gift to his constituents he teamed up with an Ohio Republican named John Kasich to author the Penny Kasich deficit reduction package the measure would have trimmed federal spending by $90 billion over a five-year period. That's 1% of federal outlays. But it's the beginning, right? So what happened? The Clinton administration trotted out all the big guns it had to stop this deficit-cutting measure. President Clinton sent a four-page letter to every House member Hillary went to Capitol Hill to twist the arms of the freshman legislators. Health and Human Services Secretary Donna Shalala spread the word that the measure would cut the women, infants, and children feeding program. Budget Director Leon Panetta told a news conference that cuts would jeopardize national security, harm economic growth, threaten several other Clinton priorities. Don't do it. Don't do it. All this for 1% cut in spending over the next five years? Well the measure was defeated, 219 to 213, which means that if four congressmen had switched their votes, it would have passed. Why was it defeated? The real reason for the intense effort to ki kill that sensible proposal had to do with cuts in Medicare funding. President Clinton even took time away from his summit meeting with Asian leaders out in Seattle to hold a press conference and tell reporters that the Penny Kasich measure, quote, would make national health reform impossible. And there's the reason. See, you're allowed to cut a program if you take the money and apply it to this socialized medicine program that he's going to ram down the throats of the American people. The Clinton message was, we are not going to allow cuts in government, Medicare now, because we need those cuts later to sweeten a gargantuan program that is going to cost bundles. That's why we didn't get the Penny Kasich sensible cutback bill. Recently up in Boston, the annual trek of the liberal premier of Nova Scotia, uh, I should mention that in Canada, the equivalent of a governor of, of our state is called a premier, the premier of the different uh, provinces is very much like a governor here. So every year, early in December, Nova Scotia sends a huge Christmas tree down to the city of Boston. And the premier of Nova Scotia always accompanies it, and then he gets to meet with people, and they have a nice time, and they probably have a pre-Christmas party, and that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. Well, this man is a medical doctor who's the premier of Nova Scotia. And while he was in Boston, you know what he said? He said to anybody who's listened, Politically and financially, the Canadian health care system has become impossible for us to continue. It doesn't work. Don't do it yourselves. Wake up. <laughs>